Hey guys. Um, today we're going to be doing the lunchtime in the August 2020 lunchtime for Coach Jeff. <coughs> and before I start anything, I want to ask you guys something. So, school is going to start pretty soon, in two days. And, well, it's going to be kind of an annoying schedule, so I probably won't have, I won't be able to do many of the contests that show up. So there are two things I can do for this. Either I can do, like, I can do a virtual contest and then screencast that, or I can, um, I can, like, drop the screencast part and just do solutions. There are kind of advantages to both of these, so I will leave a poll somewhere, um, link in the description, whatever, and, yeah. Anyway, we're going to add the new subs, <coughs> and per the request of, um, someone in the comments, I made the font size larger, so that should be nice. Yeah, and I know I said last time, I may have lied to you, that I was going to lose 7 star, right? We see there's still this here. However, it's got to happen someday. So why not today? You know, that's the ideology. <coughs> what the hell is this? Okay. Cool. Not sure if these are ordered, so we'll just um, go with whatever. Um, okay. <coughs> so we're going to create a list of segments, um, segments of free cells essentially. Alright, go zero. If, let's see. Um, create a list of segments, then if there's some big odd segment, then um, the first player will win. Otherwise, if the biggest segment is even, then the second player will always win, because they can have that segment to themselves. And... Yeah. Uh, there's a bit of casework involved here, but it should be fine, I think. So let's see. If AI equals zero, then plus plus R. Else, if R is greater than zero, seg stop push back R, R equals zero. And we'll put that here as well. So if segs.size equals 1, then um, <coughs> if segs.size equals 1, so let's say if it's 0 first, then um, So it's only the parity of the segment, seg0 mod 2. If it's odd, then the first player wins. Otherwise, the second player wins. I'll describe the strategies after, else. So if seg0 mod 2 is equal to 0, There's an extra case I have to add here. <coughs> um, what would it be? That
it would be that um, so they can get no oh, wait um reverse no sort segs R begin some reverse order segs that are in. I'm just going to do this for debugging. What? Did it not compile? Um, that's fine. I don't think we're reading in test cases. Huh? Nope. Yes, no, yes, no. Okay, well, I'm not going to test it more because it's a lunchtime, so, you know, we can do what we want. And there's no penalty, pretty sure. Yeah, there are no penalties for incorrect submissions. So let's just try it. Try and read the second problem. Okay, that's fine. We have part of the problem. Oh wait, um How does this work? There's some annoying case width that comes on when there are very small sizes. That is so There are some sizes here. What happens? I think if uh, I think if both things are one, then it still loses. Oh wait, this should be divided by two. Whoops, my bad. <laughs> nice. Okay, that's fine. So, his mission is to counter aliens which are threatening the Earth. According to information gathered by the organization, there are N alien spaceships. <coughs> okay, we got it. Um, so, you have to find the maximum cooldown time. Okay, I assume this is binary search on the answer because that just seems like it. Oh, Taurus is doing this, Jesus. Okay, well, that's that's going to be great. Yeah, so I assume this is binary search. That is probably fine. Um, okay, we have a number of test cases. And... <coughs> LLD is my allies for doubles. Long doubles instead of LD for some reason, because I'm weird. Um, LD. 
then we sort. So L equals zero. Let's see. R equals two and nine. I think that works. When you're doing binary search with doubles, it's usually good to use a fixed number of iterations instead of. Um, wait, does two and nine work? I think so. Also, fix. Um, I don't know. Fifteen. <laughs> Why not? things. So um, let's see. If AI is greater than cur, cur equals AI. Um, now, if cur is greater than is greater than greater than AI plus K I'm using K for D then it's not possible because um, you're forced to fire after they reach Earth so we break Cur otherwise um, we have a cooldown time of M so we have to add that if it's possible, then we can try a higher one. So L equals M. Otherwise, we have to go lower, so set the right boundary. And that should work. Uh, right, I forgot I got rid of this template. See out, set precision. I'll go 13 or 10. Fixed. What else was the problem? Um, IT plus plus. Yep. Should be 1.5, 2.0. Uh, it's kind of sketchy. Just make that smaller. Okay. It's fine. I actually don't know why. You don't have to do this every time, you just have to do it like at the beginning or something, but it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> oh, that's fun. Counting graphs. Find the number of undirected, unweighted, connected, simple graphs, okay, with n vertices and m edges. Okay, we got the second one. Um, cool. Where does that put us right now? Hmm. Am I the only one to solve this yet? Well, this is very simple, so I assume people will other other people yeah, other people will solve this. Yeah, for each i, the shortest path from vertex 1 to vertex i is unique, and its length is equal to ai. Okay. So I'm guessing it would be a tree or something, and then... Okay, so if the shortest path is unique, then it has to be a tree. Like a tree with some extra edges on it, I assume. That can be our structure. And... Wait, how, does, how would that work? 4, 3, 1, 2, 1.
Oh, I see. Okay. Oh yeah, we got the speed going on. Okay. Um, so the way this would work is <coughs> Yeah, so it'd be like one, two, four, and then stick the three onto this one or this one. So let's first just solve for m equals m minus one. Then Yeah. Um, reading the array. So then we check all this and this zero size of this, this zero equals one. Actually, let's do um count. Then if count, uh, actually, let's just do this. So l ants equals one. Ants equals ants count i minus 1 mod mod if count i minus 1 is greater than 0 plus plus count i. Actually, it's not even necessary, but we'll do it anyway, because why not? So again, this only solves the first subtask. I just want to convert. I just want to um, confirm my idea. And then if so, we'll figure out how to put edges on the tree. Or not solve the problem. Okay. Wait, what? No. N minus 1. N minus 1. N minus 1. Huh? Be that and then AI. I'm not sure why that. Okay, what? Yeah. Why is that? Shoot. AI minus one. Stop being stupid. Okay, that's fine. We get the second one wrong, but that's fine because we're only going for the first subtask right now. So it has to form a tree, and then we figure out how to put things on the tree. So then what? Um, then we can put two edges between A and... We can put an edge between x and y only if okay that's good you can put an edge between x and y only if there are certain things that happen what's happening right now is this slow to update m minus n so these are the remaining edges we use, and okay, there is, yeah, we can put an edge between um, any two vertices that are at the same depth, essentially, and that is those are the only edges we can add, because if we add any other edges, it'll either create a new shortest path to some vertex, or it will make a shorter path, which is not what we want. So, huh? 
How does this work? What is m? Okay, 2 times 10 to the 5th, so it's big as the takeaway. Um, we're not doing that terrible. Yeah, second is quote unquote not bad. Okay, anyway. We have a lot of things to choose from. There are many possible new edges we can add. It's like some big number choose some other number. We can't have huge binomials, so how do we do this? So it's n choose k, except there are... Uh, I see. So we just have to like manually compute n choose k for a small number. So ll tot equals 0. And i plus plus tot equals, um, what would it be? ai times, no, it should be, we're basically computing the total number of edges we can possibly have. Every edge is independent, so we can do whatever we want. i minus 1 over 2. It doesn't matter that we don't mod. Actually, it's important that we don't mod here. Ants equals ants times nck tote rest mod mod. And we have to do some weird computing for. It's a very large n, but that's fine. We're computing n times. So let's see, for LLI equals, we need a mod inverse here. Doesn't matter that it's n log n, I think it's fine, because like our only other submission literally is one second. I is greater than k, i minus minus, r equals r times i, mod mod. This is all combinatorics, so I can show you why this works later. Then for LLI equals one, i is less than, k, less than, or, wait. i is greater than n minus k equal to k i plus plus r equals r times nm mm i mod mod yeah wait actually hang on let's do something else first so if n is less than k turn zero and return r yeah. Okay. Submit again, but this time for good, hopefully. Okay, now is there any bug here? Um, well, technically we haven't actually tested any of this part, so maybe it's going to be wrong, but or not, okay. So we have three problems, 20 minutes in, it's a great start. Happy with this. Where are we right now? So I guess we're still in second. All right. Elevator. Kind of sad this isn't a cook off now because we have a really great start on the easy problems. This problem consists of m floors and there's an elevator that is used to move between different floors. The elevator is connected with a computer which registers its movement in a sequence B. Hmm. Whenever the elevator moves to a different floor, Interesting. Where does it start? It can start wherever. Okay, that's fine. So the answer for this should be zero. The answer for this should be 
Yeah, you have to go somewhere. We still have this open. So we have to go somewhere. Where would we have to go? How many problems are there called chefing and swaps or chef and swaps? I swear there've definitely been others. Okay, so the middle number of times elevators change the direction. Call chef by answering this question or determine that the sequence B is invalid. Right, 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 right. So every um, every group of negative ones is independent because it doesn't really matter like what happens. Um, So that's fine. So basically, we have to solve for a group of negative ones a starting point and an end point. And the group of negative ones on the ends are special, which is annoying. Why is the subtask useful? Um, it means we can do it in n squared. Does n squared help in some way? In a lot of cases, that make it impossible. It's impossible if, for example, in this case, if you can't get to, um, if you can't get there fast enough, it would be impossible also if they aren't the same parity. So if you had two negative one three, if you have two negative one three, that's not possible because like. No matter what, you have to move the same parity as the um, like the difference between the the two things. Okay, terrorist is spending some time on this, which is kind of scary because I don't know what this means. So first, let's check if it's possible, I guess. Are there, are there only two cases where it's impossible? The first is that, OK, the first case where it would be impossible is, I'm scared. <laughs> the first case where it would be impossible is if you have some number. Actually, how's this going? Does anyone, does anyone else have 300 now? Not really. I mean, okay, these problems are relatively simple, so I assume people will catch up soon. Which means we have to maintain our lead. Okay. So, here. Um, There are many cases. There are a lot of cases for this problem, I think, which I don't like. Oh, and the last direction we are moving is important, too. Oh, that's annoying. <sighs> yeah, this is annoying, isn't it? So how would you solve the, um, the the hardest case where you have a bunch of negative ones in a row? Because that matters.
Joy. I think what we can do is we can check div 2 and see which problem is in div 2. Okay, it's elevator. So that's what we're expected to solve, I guess. Great. So I guess elevator is what they think is the next easiest, which I'm not happy with because this problem is very annoying already. I see. Okay, I see why the subtask is helpful actually. Because um, we can do sort of a DP where DPI is the current state and then the last place we came from. Or, I mean, did we come from above or before? Or, did we come from above or below? And then that's simple. That's not nice. Let's just do that for the subtask, I guess. Maybe we can get a thumbnail of beating tourists. That'd be funny. Um. Actually, it doesn't work for the subtask because M is actually what matters. No, okay, never mind. M. Two. LB equals So if everything is negative one So if everything is negative one then there's a special case here where we'll go from 1 to n, n to 1, 1 to n, n to 1, and so on. In that case, after n turns, wait, for n plus 1 turns, we'll have to do a swap. For how this one? Or 1 to m. So we start at 1, go to m. That's m turns. Then after m, so at m plus 1 turns, we make a swap. Then at m, wait, at 2m turns, we have to make another swap. So I guess it's, um, That's kind of it, because we subtract 2, because we want it to be like m minus 1 maps to 1, at 2m minus 2 maps to 2, and so on. Okay, is this one easier? Bitwise or... Wait, reorder? Uh, contiguous. Okay. So if this is true, we'll have, how does this work? Does that work? It'll be 
So we have M swaps free at the beginning. Then we have to make another one. Or not swap, movements. So we have 2M minus... And once we get to M plus 1, we have to do something. Then we can do 2M minus 1. Then once we get to M, 2M, then we have to do something else. So I think that works. And now... Otherwise, um, tar equals AI. Is it even worth it? I'm not sure. Might just be better to try and solve the problem by itself. I'll say that might be better. Yeah, I think that's better. So now we'll have DPB the position, and then we'll have it most like positive or negative. We'll have it most two end states for test case, two million in total should be fine. For LLI equals zero, I is less than n, i plus plus. Um, dp i0 equals dp i1 goes on that big number. Let's call it mod mod. And we need zero um, changes to get here. Now How would we do this? So if the first thing is negative one, then okay, it's not fun. So we do like a weird. I don't know. It's not two pointers exactly, but it kind of is. And we have to solve for everything. How does this work?
Not sure which one is the better one to go for here. Because this is annoying. This one seems harder. I'm not sure how to do this one. I think we can do it independently for all the bits. Basically, if there's one bit that we can get on one side, all right. Can we? I don't, I don't know if that works. Like, if we have at least two of each bit, then. No, it doesn't really work. Do good sequences look like? Hmm. Maybe we should go for elevator. God, Turf is a monster. Okay. Checking for validity is simple. What we need to do is figure out how to count the minimum number of... Like, given a starting point, an end point, and a previous direction, we need to count the minimum number of changes in direction. So it's going to be like they keep going in that direction until they can't anymore. Then they'll go back down. Like let's say we start going up. Then we'll keep going in the, we'll keep going up until either we have to go back down or we can't reach the thing, or we hit the limit. Then So it's n over m is the complexity. That's fine. That's fine. 
Um, I think it's okay if we just try and kill off as many moves as possible. Then that's fine. Very annoying though. Yeah, ends are fun. We just need to solve for like the middle of a sequence. So we're trying to get from one to three or something, and then we have six moves, and M is four. How do we even solve for the beginning? That's a good question, too. So we start wherever we want, we can go in any direction we want, and we have to get to a specific cell or a specific location. Then it's like we just. We create it somehow? It's quite annoying. So let's just do a subtask, it doesn't matter.
How is this even work? Wait, why is n squared better? Actually, I'm not sure if this dp will actually work. It's kind of n m n times m, which doesn't work. I don't think. Yeah, we're just gonna have to bash this out. I think. Okay, so. Does it help to check the answer explicitly? Let's see if we can do it in X number of moves. What if we fix that? Guarantee that the ends are no, it doesn't. So we're here. Let me try to hang on. Is this an easy subtest to do? Two consecutive odd elements and replace them by a single element, their sum. You have to print the sequence itself. Oh, I see. So the subtask is subtask is simple. I think. Let's do that. that. That looks nicer. So yeah, it looks simple. If a zero mod two equals zero. Everything is even, then we can combine it into one. Otherwise, everything's odd, so it depends on the parity of n. So if n is if n is even, we can still do that because we can make everything even. n mod two equals zero. Else. N is odd, so we can make everything but the first element into even, and that will be like 2. Two S minus A is zero. All right. A is zero.
2, 1, 2, fine. 1, 4, 1, 10, 117. What is this? Why is that happening? Two. A zero. Why is A zero three? How is S3? How is A03? What's happening? Why would N be 1? Oh, we didn't <laughs> screw my own input. Epic. Idiot. S forty nine seven okay. I'm actually an idiot. I don't know why I recompiled it. Uh, one four. What? Oh, there's some plus one. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Fine, fine. That would make more sense actually. Okay, okay. So... So we kind of misread, that's fine. Um...
kind of a different algorithm, but it's similar in nature. Okay. What is this? Add this check here also. Why did we paste it twice? What? with that. Alright, so just gonna limit this. happens here. Blow up. What happens here? Well, I'm not printing also. Okay, fine. What? So we're in the input array. And this just goes insane. So is this a problem? While next dot size is greater than zero. Oh wait. Oh my god. Guess we have to move this here and then I mean this shouldn't be that big a deal, right? 
Well, next that size greater than zero. Where is this happening? <laughs> Give my code as input. So is that what it was? I guess it was. Um, I'm scared of this though. Okay, one five, where am I printing stuff? Five two one eight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is two one two. That's zero. The hell? So two two. Here. So two Need to make these backslash n for debugging since otherwise it's crazy messy. So two, two and two, that's perfect. We have two Vs. See how a what happens? to erase these. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, I don't know why. <laughs> don't know why we did that. That was kind of stupid. Okay, let's see. That's not right. What happens then? So, 212, 222, that doesn't even work. Oh, because we have this. Because we have this stupid debugging thing, right? Okay. No, infinite loops. Where does infinite loop? Infinite loops here. Why do we get rid of that? what happens. So, 2, 1, 2, 1, 5, yep, yeah. 1, how does this happen? 5, 5, 1, 5, 5, 2, combined to 10, okay, 13, fine. Two 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 two. But this isn't right. Yeah, I don't think it's right. Cause um
So I can make five. And I can make five. And I can make 13, okay. How does this work? So if they're all odd at all even, we want to make it so they're How's this work? Will there be certain elements like at the back? Um, it's going to collapse the first two. And we can collapse the last two. And we need the le next last two. Not sure how to do that one. It's any group of four we can collapse into the same parity. So before we can collapse in the same parity. Then we when we don't have a group before
rs equals zero, then we have to wait. If it's odd, if it's initially odd, we make one even thing which adds an element. Otherwise, we do that. Okay, now. Let's see what happens here. So two one two that's necessary. One five that we can do. One thirteen that we can do. Two two thirteen. Okay, I think this is better. I'm not sure if it's exactly correct, but it should be at the very least better. So this will solve the first subtask if it does. I definitely don't expect to get the second subtask. We have one solve on each of these G's. Okay. Why does that happen? Should hmm. is there a way to make this work? Two, 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 two. That'd be five, 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 Not eleven, no, ten, two, ten, ten, and two, twenty one. So two, two, ten, ten. Two, two, ten, ten. And twenty one, five, twenty six. So do elements matter here? Hmm. 
Maybe they do somehow. So five, five, ten. Five, five, ten. So two, 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 ten, ten. Now we have two, two, ten, ten. Collapse to 26, then we have 2 plus 26, which is 29. Okay, so maybe we need to test some ones with 1. It's 9, 10, 11. So with 8, it's 5, 5, 10. Okay. So here we have 1, 5, 5, which is 1, 10. Is it possible to do better? I don't think so. So 1, 1. It's 1, 1, 5, 5, which is... 10, 2, 13. Then 1, 1, 1, 5, 5. Yeah, I'm not sure what is with this. Be better somehow. Can we get nine to one element? Maybe it's not minimal or something. Not sure. So is there a better way to collapse this? So the reason we do it from the back is because Oh wait. Oh. I think that could happen, maybe. Then, um, if a zero, Let's just change any of our answers. Shouldn't. Okay, I think that is an edge case there. 
because possibly we end up with two identical elements that are I'm not sure. Might also not be, it might be something else. Okay. Mm. What would it be then? X, Y, that size is greater than or equal to 4. Read up back mod 2 is equal to 0 plus plus S. Two, two, two.
Five demons. What am I missing here? So I'm gonna go one, eight up back. Next up, size great, let's hear it. So B equals next up back. So we're pushing these elements in reverse order, then adding them in reverse order, so that it adds them in the original order. Now if we have some elements left, I can't see why this would be wrong. Okay. These aren't helpful. Take too long to compute. What do you have? Six. So it's three eleven. That should be twenty three. Yeah. Ten. Then six. For six we can do um make these even. So six should be the one where we don't have anything to do. Yeah. Don't know why this is wrong. What is happening? So there are two ways it can be wrong. The sum is not, or three ways, I guess. The order is not optimal, the sum is not optimal, or something else is not optimal. I assume we would want to make bigger things in the back. I guess it'd be this. Why don't we just do this instead? I don't know what it changes then. 
Maybe it changes something. Some is not optimal, order is not optimal, or something else. Well, the final sequence is of length at most two. No, yeah, two. Because if. How would it be three? I'm pretty sure this is wrong, but um, it would be three only if it can't be three. Because at each point, we try and make it so everything's the same parity if the length is greater than or equal to 4. Because we can collapse every 4 elements into something with the same parity. Um, what? Why? Okay, okay. Honestly, I'm not going to question it. Don't even know why that works, but whatever. Now, is there a way to easily extend this to the, easy, to the hard version? Um, maybe there would be. It would be nice if there was. I don't see an easy way to extend this, so I guess we can go back to elevator. I don't know. This problem is annoying on its own. How about this one? This one seems nicer. So.
because we can get the subtask for elevator. I know how to do that. Undo all of this, get rid of all this code. I think Notepad stores a full history, which is nice because I can just revert back to what we had before. What do we do? Alright, we're here. So we want to rescale the elements so that the target we have is n, which means we do that.
Pod. Left operand of comma operator has no effect. What is it trying to compile here? Oh, okay. It should be double end. So all of that is wrong. Nice. Why does it tell me? Why does it actually work? I haven't really tested it thoroughly, however, because it's lunchtime and there's no penalty, might as well just try it. Submit it first, then look and see if there are any issues. So this is the element we can go up to. If it's within the range, then if the next value is negative 1 or it's equal to that value, then we set it to the minimum of what we came from before, or we can switch directions, I guess. Like say we just came from above, then we'll switch again to go back above. Same thing here. Epic. Okay, TLE is fine. Runtime error is fine. Wrong answer is not fine. What's with that? Okay, wait. So, should be an element within the range of n and 2 times n. Let's just get rid of that edge case because maybe it's not necessary. Okay, but what we can do is something like, I don't know, one for example, right? Then I don't think I don't expect this to be right, but yeah, okay. So this can be like two, three, two, one. How exactly are we getting here? What are these?
So that makes it within the bound. Which four is right, I think. So we'll try that. Why is that necessary? That's a concern. Oh! That may be it. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay, so we have those. So this will work in either timeout or runtime error, it doesn't really matter. Point is we have the first subtask, which is good. So now, we have 400 points, we have two half problems, and we optimize something. Maybe we can also try for the third problem. Okay, that needs to update, fine. So, Let's see what we can do about this problem. Um, so in what case this is not possible? Basically in every position there's at least one bit that occurs in one half, but not in the other. Okay, so there are 20 bits. Subtask is small sizes. Um, not sure how that helps. Does it help at all? Okay. So first, if any bit occurs exactly once, then we're done. If any bit occurs zero times, we can ignore it. And otherwise, we have a problem.
at most one side. If we take the bitwise aura of all the elements, at most one side must be able to have that aura at all times. So I guess we can think of it like this. At some point, so the only way they have the same bitwise or is if they have the total bitwise or the array, and that will happen if. That will happen if something. Get that color. That will happen if something. What happens then?
let's try something. So this code is saved in the submission, which means we can get rid of it. I'm actually not sure if this works. So I think in any case where about an array is not good, then there's something like this. There are two values of bits such that all of one bit is on one side of some line and the other bit is on the other side of some line. Then that should be enough, I think. This way we're counting the number of each bits, then anything has 
one bits exact if there's exactly one number with that bit, then no matter what the array will not be good. So otherwise, okay. So now how do we do this? If there are at least two elements that have both of these bits set, then, then we can't do anything. So actually wait. If there's at least one element that has both of these bits set, then what? So if there's one element with both, then how would we do this? Is it even possible if there's one element with both?
Because when I'm on both, I don't think it actually matters what we do. Sure, how this works. I'm actually sure if, I don't even know if this is right, and I don't know how to implement it. So, maybe there's a better way to do something. What else is there to solve? We can solve one of the two.
Uh, I don't know where to go here. All of these seem either annoying or not possible for me. What about this? Is there something we can do here? We make a match. I guess we'll want to do it to the left or something. I don't know. It's going to be very messy, I think. So another way to think about this problem, the swaps one, is that if there's, say there's some array, the positions where this finally gets the maximum bitwise OR, and let's say the position where this side gets the maximum bitwise OR, they have to pass each other. If they're at the same spot, then we could divide the array here, and if they're before each other, then we can divide the array anywhere. So they have to be past each other. No. What is interesting about this? So, how are people doing? Beautiful hammer, as always. So, what do we do here? What happens in this gap? Like, let's say we have zero, one, zero here, and then, like, I don't know, one, zero, zero. So all of these are that. Then in this gap, maybe this could be, like, zero, zero, one. Like, this would be zero, one, one, and this would be one, zero, one. Is that possible? Because then this would be... Um, this bitwise or would be 101, which is not enough, and it will be enough after this. And this bitwise or would be 011, which is not enough, but it will be enough after this. Okay. So the gap, it's possible to have a gap of any size, basically.
Yeah. Because we could have, say, 2,000 of these, and then... No, wait, that... Okay, well, what, what we can also do is, like, have this, have an extra bit here, this would be zero, this would be zero, and in the middle here, we have something like one o o o. So then that would, we would need this to, to be set, to set both of them. Yeah, so we can basically make the gap whatever size we want, or the input. Like in the input, the gap can be whatever it wants to be. Smallest number of swaps. So. How do I make this happen? Did everybody even do this in n squared, or did they just cram that subtask in for no reason? I feel like that's what they did, because that's possible. Or we could fix the ends of the barrier. But how do we even ensure that the barrier actually works? It might not. And becomes small here. Is it possible to work out this case work? Like the solution for this is a bunch of case work with the negative ones, and then you do something else and it works. I don't know how to do these cases, actually. What about this? There's something of worth here. Can't greedy the hardest subtask. I think this was a good subtask though, because there's a distinct difference between this and the other one. So.
When is the sequence good? It's a question we could ask. It's kind of funny just how much tourists dominated this whole competition. Okay, let's try and do elevator, I guess. I don't have anything else. It's weird how these scores are like capped at 400 except for a couple people in tourists. Okay, at this point I can't work out this casework. It's too much to do. Two consecutive on and one second place and less than one person. Change to one two six one. I don't I don't know how to implement that one. Cause I'm finding it hard to count the actual number of inversions. Like the the number of swaps required to put everything on one side or the other. How do we do this? Let's say we're just solving for the length. That's like a binary um, sequence where we where we either turn two zeros into a one or two ones into a zero.
So if you have three of the same kind, then huh. If three of the same kind, then you're kind of screwed. Do. Anyone else even touch that part? Well, they have touched that, but I haven't gotten it. Okay, at this point, I don't think there's anything more I can do. Don't have any leads on either of these. So I think that's enough. What I'll do instead is I'll... Um, start solving the div2 problems and then I can go over the solutions of those and what I do have. Okay, so mode So basically, in this one, you would do what it tells you to. I guess that's what it is. So basically, you just create the counts and then
So you create an array of counts. Since everything's less than 10, that's fine. Then Oh wait, actually you have to compute the mode of the frequencies. Okay, well, um, so first create the frequencies, I guess, then we still use max count. And we use like a map or something, it doesn't really matter what you do. Freaks I, um, what is it? Count I. Second equals. So this will automatically sort by the first value, which means we'll get the minimum. So basically, take the frequencies, then put them all into a map counting the frequencies, maintain the maximum count of any frequency, and then print the first element in the map that has that frequency. Or that has that count of frequencies. So there are only um, there are not that many elements. I mean, there are only there are only ten possible frequencies, which means there's a bit of optimization you can do here, but it's not that big a deal. Let's do this. So there were Fide, nice. There are n players and player hours right all right so is there a feed a for cp is that the point i just closed it why why did i close it okay well i got it so that's good now we do this there are n players and player hours right all right for the start of the tournament How would they do this? <sighs> okay, so First, we can simulate the process by basically computing. We add the rating change, compute the rating at each point, and then the ranking at each, each point. Um, so what we can do is I'll rating and M, I'll rank and M, then four zero. We use A to represent the current ratings, then. How does this work? The next, wait, what? Oh, I see. So for L uh, I equals zero, I is less than N, I plus plus. Read in the change, then AI plus equals plus equals change, then rating AI. Now we compute the ranks, so for each month. We basically use a coordinate compression style thing to Compute the rankings. 
um, else and we'll start we'll sort we'll store um, rating contestant or person rather then vowels I equals make pair AI no wait, rating I J I then sort them then so basically we need to break ties by saying if this value is less than certain reverse order since we want bigger ones to be first then if this value is less than the previous one that means it's in a different it's not tied with it anymore but if it's the same as the previous one then it's tied so we don't change the ranking otherwise we do change the ranking to the new position that the current player has so if i is greater than zero and vowels or vowels i dot first all right, if i is greater than zero, so this is different. Vowels i dot first is less than vowels i minus one dot first, then the ranking change, so we have to set it to the index plus one because zero indexing, then rank i of this person in this month, vowels i dot second at this month equals cur rank. Uh, okay, now, now that we have the ratings and the ranks, we just have to do the, the statistics, whatever. So let's do it for each person individually. Then we'll find... Um, let's call it best rank equals 27, and that's something huge, then 4 lj equals 0, j for each thing, just take the minimum, because the minimum is better, okay, so, Let me do this. Let me find the position. Actually, there's a better way to do this. What we'll do is we'll store a pair. No, actually, that doesn't exactly work. It, it works for the ranking, but not the rating, so I'll just do it normally. Best rank equals, or if this is equal to the best, best pause equals j, then we break because we don't want to do it again later since we want the minimum position. Then we do the same thing for rating. Yeah, and the, re the reason I the reason I stopped trying to solve Div1 problems is just because like I like there was no way I could solve anything else at this point. Was basically just tapped out. Now, if well, then we'll count the ones so. It's not bad. I'm not actually sure if this will be a rating gain or a rating loss at this point. Actually, I, I kind of want to find out how many people were there 
in the cook-off. There were... There were fewer. Okay. So now we have a better rank with more people. And there's tourists, which is kind of a big factor. Then... I mean, this is better. I'm not sure. Maybe it is. Okay, so we're going to just, um, what do we want to count? We want to count the number of times where they're different. Okay. Rating pause not equal to rank. Pause. Increase the answer. Then print it. Fine if they're not initialized. Because it will be initialized. What is the subtask? Like, what would this be? Would it be you manually take the maximums or something? Okay. Let's. Oh, we can't submit, can we? No, we can't because it's going to. We have to move it to. They have to move it to practice first. Okay, so I'll explain what I can. Even though this was initially the last problem, it moved to be um, div one e, so that's fine. Um, okay, I guess I'll wait to submit this. Okay, so I'm going to take a second to just clear my head. I want to do all the solutions at once, so, um, I will just wait until I can submit this, verify it's true, and then we'll do what we can. Okay, I'll be right back. I'm gonna get water. Yeah. Let's see, still don't have the ability to submit. Sadly. I don't, know, I don't think it's enough to lose red, which is fine. Might be another rating loss, but hopefully it's just small, I think. Should be small. We're always right on the edge, aren't we? We're getting closer and closer to the 2500 barrier because we came in at 2502, which is insanely close. And then we got a tiny rating gain plus 41 here. And then a small rating loss minus 21. And now something else might happen. Um, maybe we can submit to the Div 2 version. I'll try that. And then later on, I'll submit it to the Div 1 so I can have everything in one link.
Actually, I'll just link all of my submissions anyway, so it doesn't matter. Wow, two people have solved elevator. Jeez. Okay. Um. Wait, this was easier? Huh. I guess this one is annoying to implement, which is kind of true. I mean, look at all this. To do all this stuff. I'm going to keep waiting to be able to submit. So I'd just rather do that first. Yeah, 13th is not bad, I would say. When is this going to happen? What was this one? All right, this was the trees. Okay. When is this going to happen? What does V actually stand for? Okay, so it's just a non-English thing. French, I'm not sure. Don't really want to say. So we'll wait for something to happen. I guess I might as well go over this. Um, yeah, why not? Maybe the time by the time we get to here, we'll be able to do stuff. So, mode of frequencies. Um, basically, what this problem asks is, okay, I'm gonna ignore these scribbles since they didn't get me anywhere. So, you're given some array. Let's take the sample. Um, five two two nine, or five nine. Two nine seven two five seven two five three. Okay. Now what you want to do is first you want to compute all the frequencies of the numbers. So for example, there are two times two. There are there's one three. There are two wait. Oh, there are two fives. There's one seven, and there are two nines. So these are all the frequencies. Um, something important is that, or something kind of important is that all the numbers are at most 10, which means that you can do these frequencies with an array of size 10 each time. Then, once you have these frequencies, you're going to put them all in their own list. One, one, two, 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 for example. And then you want to find the frequency that occurs the most. So for example, or this is called the mode, you want to find the mode of the frequency. So for example, this occurs twice, this occurs three times, so that's it. This is the mode. Two is the mode because it occurs the most times. However, if we were to add some other element, like one, then we would have an extra element with one frequency. So now we have a tie, 
And in the case of a tie, we want to take the one with minimum um, value. So in this case, it will be 1, not 2, because even though they both have 3, 1 is less than 2. So the way we do this is first, I can kind of give some code. We can, we can just create a frequency array. And it has to be 11 if we um, zero index the array. Or you can decrement all of the values so that the array, so that the array values are 0 to 9. Whatever you want to do. Basically, just make a small array. Initialize everything to 0. Then, for each element, just increment the frequency of that element. So, like, I don't know. I don't know why I'm giving so much detail here. But yeah, this is... Those, so you would just increment the frequency of that. So now once you have these frequencies, you can... For every frequency that's greater than 0, because if it's not greater than 0, you won't care about it. Because um, it means the element isn't in the array. <coughs> there are many ways you can find the mode. What I just did was I... We can note that the frequencies are at most n because they're at most n elements. So you can create another big count array of size n. Most of it's going to be zeros. Then you can just reset it smartly between each test case. Um, I'll leave that to you to figure out how to do that. Basically, only reset the elements that you changed this time. Or what I just did was very simple. We'll go to my code because why not? And I used something called a map, which is very simple. You initialize it like this, and then you can just use it like an array. And then you iterate through all of those. And basically, first you find the maximum count. So we'll say it's three. And then you go through the elements in increasing order. And whichever one you find first that has the maximum count is the one you want to print. because. Even though these both have the maximum count, if you iterate like this, you'll see one first because it's lower. And because one has the maximum count, you are done. If we had some other element, say like zero, I don't know, and then it had a count of one, then it doesn't have the maximum count, so we would ignore it. So you use a map to store the frequencies of the frequencies, then take the maximum of that, take the maximum of all those frequencies, iterate in increasing order, Iterate in increasing order, and then just um, print the first one you find that has the maximum frequency. There are many ways to implement this. It's it's solely an implementation problem, basically. Okay, so I should be able to submit this now. Yep. Let me just make a change. Okay. So this one, unfortunately, is also an implementation problem. Um, yeah. Basically, there's a rating system, much like Kocha. And, what? Okay. Well, first, I should make sure my own code works. So it passes the sample, right? But it passes only the sample. Um, okay, what's with that? So you read in N and out. Then you have a rating and you have a rank. Then for each element, read in its initial rating. Then for each element, read in all of its changes. AI plus equals change. Then rating IJ plus equals AI. Okay, now for each element up to M. M. This is basically compute ratings, then you compute the ranks, compute min, max, ratings,
what, what is this? What's happening here? So, compute the ranks. So for each month, then put everything in that month, then sort them, reverse them, then as I dot f is less than the previous one, then we change it. Otherwise, we don't because they're tied. Wait. Okay. So now we have to do this smoothly. So for each person, we'll compute its best rank. Oh wait, this should be max. Whoops. Because yeah. Okay. My bad. Um. I'm actually kind of surprised that passed the sample. Because rating, we want it to be as high as possible, while ranking, we want it to be as low as possible. Okay. So, let's wait for that to work, and then... Okay. Cool. So, we solve that. Now, what we do is we... Let's explain how it works. So this is also an implementation problem. Um, kind of sad that this is all they give to the div two people. Just implementation. Basically, I think it should be more challenging. Because the hardest thing about this is making is knowing how to implement it, right? Anyway, whatever. So you have so you have n people. And they all have an initial rating. Let's take, let's yoink the sample. So we have two people, and one has an initial rating of 2125, and the other has an initial rating of 2098. OK. Now there are m months. Um, in this case, there are three months. After every month, someone after every month, every person's rating will change. It could possibly change by zero. The changes are small. All the values are small. And yeah, so everything is small. So let's, for example, draw out the rating changes. So the first player, after the first month, their rating change is minus 20, sad. Then after the second month, the rating change is plus 10, then a, a minus 10 afterwards. For the second player, the rating change is plus 10, plus 10, and minus 20. We don't have to assume the rating changes make sense. Like, it, do, like it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game, for example, where the minus of this is equal to the plus of this. Uh, like, there's no guarantees about that, and it doesn't really matter. So let's, yeah. So we can assume all the ratings are, like, independent of each other, basically. And there's no weird constraints. So what would happen to each rating? Well, this would become 2105. This would become 2115. And, wait, what? Oh. And this would become 2105. Funny that these all happen to be orange. Okay, so now we have for this one it'd be twenty one oh eight, then twenty one eighteen, then twenty ninety eight. So now after every month, each player has a ranking in the rating system. So for example, this guy has the higher rating, so his rank in this month is one, and this guy's rank is two. This guy also has the higher rating on this one, so the ranks are 1 and 2. And this time, the left guy has the higher rating, so the ranks are 1 and 2. Um, in case of ties, it will basically work like this. So let's say there are three people with rating 5, and then two people with rating 2. Then all the people with rating 5 will be first, and then everyone with rating 2 will be fourth, because there are three people ahead of each of these. So the ranking is basically 1 plus the number of people that have strictly greater rating than them. Um, that's one way to compute it, although 
Um, I, I think the constraints don't allow that, so you have to be faster. And interesting, there are 30 points here. Wait, how did this work for the other one? Um, mode of frequencies was interesting. So the subtasks were worth fewer points. Okay, so now we have that everything has a rank and everything has a rating. So now what we actually want to find out with all this information is consider the point where each player hits their peak rating. So, for example, this guy's peak rating is 2115, this guy's peak rating is 2118. And also consider the first point where they hit their peak rank. So this guy's peak rank, peak rank is 1, which is here, and this guy's peak rank is also 1, except we, we only consider the first point where they hit it, for both the rank and the rating. So, the first point where they hit rank 1 is here. The same thing if this guy had 2118 somewhere else, then if it was before, the peak rating would actually be here. We consider it like that. And if it was after, then we would ignore it because we want the first point where they hit the peak rating. And of course, same for the rank. So, we want to count the number of people for which the months in which they hit their peak rank and peak rating are different. So for example, both of these work. If we had some other player, let's say, I don't know, let's say 5, right? And then he had, um, he changed to 6, and then 7, or he changed to 8, and then 7, and then 6. Then their rank is obviously 3, 3, and 3, and these are the same, the peak rating and the peak rank, so this wouldn't count. Um, we also don't consider the initial rating values. That is, even though they start with some rating here, and this is in fact this guy's highest rating, we don't care about it. We only care about what happens after each of these months. Okay, that's the problem statement. How do we, like, do this? And, um, just keep frantically checking. I don't know. The way to do it is just kind of do it. Like, so first you list out all the rating changes, right? Then, obviously, the new rating is the old rating plus the rating change. So, for each player, you can compute their rating. Then, like, this rating is equal to the old rating plus the rating change. So, the rating of month 3 is the rating of month 2 plus the rating change in month 3. And so on. So, you can compute the ratings for each player in each month. Then you want to use the ratings to compute the ranks for each player in each month. So, how do we do the ranks? The ranks is slightly harder because um, if there are n players and m months, you can't do it in n squared times m because the constraints are not going to allow that. So, um, there's something better you can do. And essentially, let's solve for all of the ranks that happened in a specific month. I'm running out of colors here. Let's solve for all of the... Let's solve for all of the ratings that happened in a specific month. So, for example, let's say we're solving for um, 5, 5, 3, 2, 2, 1. Right? So... Actually, no, let's not reverse it first. Let's say we have like 5, 3, 2, 1, 5, 2. So basically what we want to do is we want to have this array sorted in descending order. Because then it'd be convenient because we can just do whatever we... Because then we can easily iterate through this and find the rank of each person. But we have to maintain the index somehow. So what we can do is we can basically, instead of sorting just the array, we can sort an array of like structures or pairs, however you want to make it, of essentially rating index. These are the pairs. Sorry for that handwriting. Then if we do it for all of these, this person has rating 1 and index 4, this person has rating 5 and index 5, and this person has rating 2 and index 6. Then we sort these pairs, and basically we sort it so the 
We start it first by the first element and then arbitrarily by the second element. So let's say we start it in fully descending order. Then we'll have an array of, let's say, 5, 5, 5, 1, 3, that's not a 3, 3, comma, still not a 3, 3, comma, 2, 2, comma, 6, 2, 3, and um, 1, 4. Now the ranks we we're going to assign is 1, 1, 3, 4, 4, 6. And now we know which players to assign the ranks to because we kept track of the index. So now we know the player index 5 gets rank 1, the player index 1 gets rank 1, the player index 2 gets rank 3, and so on. Um, the way we compute the ranks is also simple. Basically, it's kind of like a tiny bit like dynamic programming, but not really. Let's say we've computed the ranks of everything before this player, or this person, right? So we know that, actually, let's just do it yeah, like sequentially. So first of all, the first player has to have rank 1. Now, now we look at this player. Now, either it has the same value as the player before it or not. If it does, obviously it has to have the same rank. So this is 1. Otherwise, it doesn't. But because this array is sorted in descending order by value, if this doesn't, and therefore this is greater than this, we know that everything before this element also has a value greater than this, which means that its rank is just its index in, this, in the list. Because there are two elements before it, both of them are greater than it, so this is the third like this is the third rank. So then this is the same. This is less than the previous element, which means which means there are three other elements greater than it, so this has to be rank three plus one, which is four. This is the same as this, so this is four. And this is different, so it's five plus one, which is six. And that's how you do ranks. So this was the hardest part, basically, because you have to do it more efficiently than just doing it naively. So the sorting happens for each month, so it's something like um, n log n times m. I'll write out the complexity later. But now we have the ranks. So now we have all this information, and we can treat each player independently. At this point, all you have to do is kind of similar to the last problem. Iterate through all the ratings, then find the maximum one. Then find the first point where you hit that maximum one and just store that. Then, same thing, iterate through all the ranks and find the minimum one, since we want the best rank, and best ranks are lower. Then, find the first point where you hit the minimum one, and then just compare the two months. And you do this for each player, and for each player where they're different, you just increment the answer. I don't know, plus plus ants, whatever you do. And, um, that's it. That is this problem. Uh, if you don't understand stuff, I guess you can refer to my code. I did try to comment it a bit, just to be nice. Okay. Now we get to the div 1 problems. This one was actually kind of interesting. So we're given a sequence of... Uh, uh, why do I keep switching my code? So we're given a sequence of 1s and zeros. Let's say it like this. So we'll yoink this sample. So we have 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. Every cell that's 1 is blocked, and you have two players, let's say player 1, blue, and player 2, purple. Purple's bigger for some reason. Um, and the players take alternating turns. The first player is um, the first, the blue is the first to go. But yeah, obviously the first player moves first. That's a good thing to know. And... So, in your first turn, you can pick any zero and move to it. So, for example, you can go here. However, you can't move to any one. Then, once you move to a zero, that zero becomes a one, which means it's blocked off. And now, actually, I'm going to draw these in blue. So, these become a one now, and blue's here. So, now, purple does the same thing. They can move to 
any cell that isn't yet blocked off, and then they block it off by going there. Now after the first turn, they can't jump around anymore. What they can do is they can go to any adjacent cell that is one to the left or one to the right that is not yet blocked off. So for example, this blue guy can't move here because this is a 1, but he can move here because this is a 0. So he will. And now everything around him is blocked off, which means he can't move his next turn. But purple is also surrounded by block cells, so he can't move either. He or she, whatever. And, um... Yeah, so that means purple has no... Purple has no more moves, and because it's his turn and he has no more moves, he loses. So basically, the first player to be unable to make a move loses. So given that the two players both play optimally, that is, they play like perfectly in reaction to their opponent's moves, who wins and who loses? Okay, now straight off the bat, there's kind of there's an interesting argument called. Um, Actually, no, there's some casework here. Let's do this casework first. So, every group of zeros is independent because they're blocked off from each other by ones, and therefore, um, like, they'll never, like, you'll never be able to move from one group to another, so they're all independent. Now, let's say the first player and the second player move into different groups. Let's say, for example, the first player goes here, and the second player goes here. Then, the answer is just the maximum of... Like, the answer is just the maximum of, um... Basically, you can just simulate it. So, whoever... Let's say they both start on the left. Then whoever runs out of turns first just loses. So if the groups are the same size, then the first player um, loses. Otherwise, if the big, if the first group is bigger, then the first player wins. Otherwise, if it's smaller, then they lose. Um, kind of obvious, like, just whatever happens. Every turn you use a move, so it's just count the number of moves, and whoever wins, wins. So... If, if they're going to move into different groups, obviously the first player is going to want to move into the biggest group they can. And then the second player is going to move to the next biggest group. So if the second player will lose by moving to the next biggest group, then they don't want to do that. Instead, they want to try to sabotage the first player by moving into the same group as them. So let's say the first... Let's say you have something like this. And the first player will move here. That way, if the, if the second player isn't smart, the first player will get five turns. But what the, what the second player can do is, he can block off the first player, wherever he starts. And... That's going to be it for the first player. He has no more moves. So, what the first player has to do is, he has to move into the center. Otherwise, if you move somewhere that isn't the center, remember that the second player wins if they, make, if they both have the same amount of moves that they can make. Because the second player moves second, so the first player will run out of moves first. So, if the first player moves to anywhere but the center, the second player can take the center, and they will always win. So the first player has to move into the center of the biggest group. If they move into any group that isn't bigger, then the second player can move into the biggest group, and they win. So the first player will move into the center of the biggest group. If there are an even number of elements, then there are two possible centers, and both of them are losing for the first player. Because the second player can move into the other center. Now the first player has to move like this, the second player has to move like this, and, this, and the first player, again, will run out of turns first. So if the biggest group has an even size, there's nothing the first player can do. They always lose. And similarly, if the first player moves into the other center, the second player will just move into the other center. What? They'll just move into the other center, and they'll win. So now, we assume, we assume the first group has odd size, because otherwise the first player wins. Now, if there's exactly one group, and this has odd size then the first player does win, because 
wherever the second player goes, the first player will just move to the opposite side. So let's say the second player goes here, then the first player can just move like this, and the second player has to move somewhere else. So basically it's the same game, except the second player now has to start first, because the first player can move to whichever side is worse. So, essentially, both of them will get the same amount of turns, but the second player will, it's kind of like they go first, so they'll lose. Because the second player makes a move, now he has two moves in total, and the first, pl and the first player has two plus one since they get this, but they also made their initial move. Anyway, so if, if the largest size is odd and there's one group, then the first player wins. However, there's another case that's possible. Let's say you have like another big group somewhere. Now the first player still has to move to the center, because if they don't move to the center, the second player will just block them off. Now when they move to the center, they have, um, so this has 5, so it's 5 plus 1 over 2. It's essentially the size plus 1 over 2, and we, it has to be odd, we assume that. Then, if the second player can move into an, the next biggest group that has size greater than or equal to that, then the second player still wins, because they make the most amount of moves possible. So it's, it's a very skewed game towards the second player, but yeah, that's essentially how it works. So the casework is, either there's one group... Um, so obviously if there are zero groups, then the second player wins, because the first player can't even make the first move. So if there's one group, then it depends on only the parity of the group. If it's odd, then the first player wins, otherwise the second player wins. Otherwise there's greater than one group. So if the biggest is even, the biggest is even, then automatically two. Otherwise, the biggest is odd. So then, so then either um, the size of the next biggest is greater than or equal to big plus 1 over 2, in which case the second player wins, or not, in which case the first player wins because the second player can't do anything, they'll always lose. So that's kind of the decision tree here. So either there are zero groups, obviously then the second player wins, zero groups. Two. So either there are zero groups in which the second player wins, there's one group in which if it's odd, first player wins, otherwise even. Otherwise there's more than one group, so if the biggest is even, automatically second player wins, otherwise the biggest is odd. Now if the second player has a group that's big enough to outlast the first player, then they win, otherwise the first player will win. And that's the case work. So I guess I can show you the code, even though it's basically the same thing. Um, Essentially, I created a list of the segments of zeros. Like, for example, this would have... Um, this array would have a list of a segment of size 5 and a segment of size 3. Then you sort them in descending order, that way you can have the two biggest. And... Then, basically, you see the casework. If there's zero, print no. Otherwise, it depends on the parity. Otherwise, if it's big enough, print no, or it's even. Otherwise, yes. Anyway, that's how that works. Um, yeah. So that was that problem. Bunch of casework, essentially. That's all it boils down to. Took me longer to explain than solve, actually. Okay, now, this one is very uninteresting, I think. Um, 
Basically, we're given a list of intervals. How do, how do I explain this actually? Okay, yeah, let's just say you're given a list of intervals. Um, so let's say one, two, three, four, five. And each interval is of a fixed length. So for example, in this, all intervals are length two. At a certain point in time, you can, you can destroy a certain interval. Like let's say I destroy this one at time two. Then, actually, there's some number d. Um, d is basically the distance. Actually, let's say c. c is basically the cooldown you have before you can destroy another interval. So if you destroy an interval at time 2 and c equals 1, then you have to wait one time unit to be able to destroy another interval. So you can destroy this at 3 and then this at 4. And let's say c was 2 then you would have to destroy this at 2, and you, there's no way to destroy this interval, because you can't do that. So um, basically you want to find the maximum possible value of C that lets you destroy, that still lets you destroy all intervals. Yeah. So, let's say we had some fixed value of C. Then what we would do is we would sort the intervals because all of them are a fixed length and if an interval ends earlier, you want to destroy it earlier. So then, let's say we had some fixed value of c. Let's say c equals 1.5. Then we destroy the first interval as early as possible. Then, let's say they're sorted like this. We sort them in increasing order of their first position. Then the earliest time we can destroy this interval is at c equals three point at time equals three point five since that's one point five away. Now we're trying to destroy this one, and the earliest time we can do it is at five. Now let's say c was two. We would we would go here. Then the earliest time we could destroy this is four. Then the earliest time we can destroy this doesn't exist, so it's not possible to do this. Let's say c was zero point five. Then we're here. So the cooldown will refresh at 2.5, but the next interval starts at 3, so the next time we have to destroy is basically 3. So it's basically like the maximum of last plus c and start is the time at which you can destroy this interval. Last being the previous interval you destroyed. Um, how did I do this? I think I made it some small value or something. Yeah, so basically you just sweep through the array in increasing order, and This is, and then you maintain the next point at which you can um, destroy an interval, then if this is greater than, um, if this is greater than end, then you're screwed because like you can't do anything. You destroy it too late. So you just check that over all intervals. And for example here, then after you go here, you could destroy it at 3.5. So now that we can solve it for a fixed value of c, let's note something else. Shorter cooldowns are better, because if, like, let's say we have a cooldown of 10, right? So obviously, if we have a cooldown of 10, it doesn't work. So if we have a cooldown of 11, it's strictly harder to destroy all the intervals. So if you have some cooldown that doesn't work, C invalid. If you have some like value of like C naught, then any C that's greater than or equal to C naught is also invalid, because it's strictly harder to destroy all the intervals. And similarly, if the cooldown is less, 
and there's some, let's say, valid, right? And there's some way to destroy the intervals like this. Then any um, C that's less than or equal to this is also valid. And there's a very simple proof for this, is that because the cooldown is less, all of these gaps are greater than or equal to the previous cooldown, which means they're also greater than or equal to the current cooldown. <coughs> so you can literally use the exact same time points to destroy um, the intervals as you did with a higher cooldown, and therefore that works because you guarantee that the higher cooldown works. So what this means is you can, there's some interval of points, like starting at zero, where everything works. Then there's a single point, then there's a point where it stops working. And then everything after that will also not work. Um, and in fact, this point may actually be at infinity if there's only one interval, but it doesn't matter. So basically what we want to do is we want to find this point. So the way to do this is with binary search. Let's say we start here and we have an interval here. Now we check the middle. Now this is good because we know this is valid. So everything before it is valid. So we know that this orange point is to the right of it. So we now move the left of our current interval to here. Now we look at here. This is invalid, so we know that everything in this range is invalid. So we move the right of our interval to here. Now we check here, move to the left. We check here, move the, move the right, and so on. Until we eventually converge to this orange point. That is how binary search works. And that's basically it. You binary search on the answer, find that orange point, and then print it. There's an implementation trick that I recommend using for binary search. Because precision is bad, um, what I did was instead of using, instead of doing the classic like, what is it usually? While, while the left value is less than the right value, what you can do is you'll do it for a certain number of iterations. At every point, you get like around half as close to your interval, so you increase the precision. And if you do it something like 70 times, you'll definitely have enough precision to be happy. So that's the way that works. Do it a fixed number of times, enough so you get the precision you need. And you can start the right at whatever. Since all of the values are less than or equal to 10 to the 9th, you can just make the right bigger than that, and it will work. That's how you do binary search. Huh. Wow, that is close. Jeez. <coughs> it's kind of weird, though, that we lose almost as much for basically the same rank, even though there are more people. How does that work? I guess there were more reds initially. Is that how that works? I don't know. Anyway, so now we're very close to losing red again. That's fun. But we're still red. Kind of surprising. Okay, now we have this problem. Um, Actually, I'll be right back. I'm going to go to the bathroom first, and after that, I'll explain the rest of these.
So now we're ready to have some fun. Okay. So yeah, let's wait. I want to see if this changed first. Yeah, it does. Okay. And the junior rating is also in decline because it's like a weird thing. If there are more combined rounds, there would, this would go up higher. But since most of these are Div 1 and there aren't actually that many people who do the junior competitions, it doesn't work out as well. Anyway, hanging on by a thread. Um, not the second thread though, probably the fourth thread, because there are three other threads that are below us. Anyway, it's not a reference at all, definitely. So, here you want to do what the problem says and count graphs. These are graphs with a specific property. So there's some starting node. Um, Let's say here. I'm going to draw a big circle. Then um, let's yoink the sample here. So there are. So first, you're given the number of nodes and you're given the number of edges. And there's some starting node. Let's mark it here. And everything else is relative to the starting node. So the way it works is you're given the distances that all of the other nodes should be from the starting node. So like the shortest path to each of these nodes must be some fixed length. And also, there must be exactly one shortest path. So if we have this and this, then this is invalid because even though the shortest path is 2, which ends up being what we want, it's it doesn't work because like we have two possible ways to get there with distance 2. So the first subtask is subtask. The first subtask is kind of interesting. It guarantees that m equals m minus 1, which means there are m minus 1 edges, so the graph is going to form a tree since the whole thing has to be connected. And here's how this works basically. So there are two possible graphs for these numbers. The numbers are, this has to be 1 away, this has to be 2 away, and this has to be 1 away. So the graph, obviously these have to have direct connections to the root. Then, let's say this is 0 away, because definition. Then, this node has to connect to any node that has, um, like, distance i minus 1. So basically, the number of ways to attach this node is just the number of nodes that have that distance. If there are no nodes that have that distance, then you can't construct the graph. So either of these edges work. You can make this edge and attach it to that one, or this edge and attach it to that one. So if there's a tree, then basically the answer is, this is product notation of... Or I can draw some dots here. So either of these edges will work. It's the product notation of, let's say, the count is um, the number of elements with a certain distance. Then it's the count of the depth of i minus 1. So this is nice because if any of these are 0, then automatically the answer is 0. So that's just it. For every node, the number of nodes you can attach it to is just the number of nodes that have to be one higher up. And if this is a tree, there's exactly one shortest path, so automatically we pass the first subtask with just this formula. The count of the number of nodes at the previous depth. Okay, um, let's do some stuff. Okay. But now, we have more edges. So now we have to solve the second subtask, in which we have up to 2 times 10 to the fifth edges. <clears throat> and both the sum of n and the sum of m doesn't exceed 2 times 10 to the fifth, which is cool. So let's say we create this graph, right? So we'll assume both of these, uh, actually these have 1, this has 2. 
so now we have six edges we need to distribute. This is the second sample. And basically, this works like this. So let's say we have this tree, and this tree is equivalent. So now we need to add some edges onto this tree, and we need to find out how many ways there are to make these edges. So then the answer will be the product of the number of ways to make the tree times the number of ways to um, place the rest of the edges. Since the edges of the tree don't actually matter because all of the depths are going to be the same anyway. Yeah. So what do we do here? Well, we should ask what edges can we actually make? This is undirected. So let's say we have an edge from some node to some and some um, descendant of it. Well, we can't have this edge because it shortens the shortest path. That is, we could take this edge instead of the two edges down, and it won't work. So, like, it'll be faster to take this, and therefore the shortest path is not two, so it doesn't work. But there are there are also other edges we can't do. Um, for example, we can't add this edge. And the reason for this is because it creates another shortest path. So we can't so we can't add any edges where the distance of the depths are more than two, because those are bad. They shorten the shortest path. And if we add an edge between two nodes that are at different depths that are at depths that are exactly one apart, then it creates more shortest paths. Both of these violate the conditions. However, if we take if we have edges between nodes of the same depth, then obviously they don't lengthen sh any shortest paths because taking this edge will actually increase the number of things you have to go through. And at the same time, they don't create any more because it, it creates a longer path. Like this path is of length 2, but you can take this to get length 1. So edges between vertices of the same depth are valid. So basically, the only edges we can add are ones that are between vertices of the same depth. So it's basically the number of pairs of vertices at the same depth. This is, or the number of unordered pairs. And this is the, the number of unordered pairs given a certain set of numbers is n times n minus 1 over 2, where n here is 1, n here is 2, and n here is 1, because we have two nodes at depth 1, one node at depth 0, one node at depth 2. How do we get this formula? It's simple. Once we pick one vertex, we have n minus 1 other vertices to pick. Now this gives us a formula n times n minus 1. However, picking this vertex first and this vertex second is the same as picking this vertex first and this vertex second because it's still like the, the numbers are the same. It's just the order that we pick them is different, and the order doesn't matter. So for every pair, there are exactly two ways to get it. So it's duplicated exactly twice and therefore we divide by 2. So that's how we get to this magic formula. There are also other ways to do it. Like, for example, it's the sum of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot 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 plus n minus 1. So you can get it that way, and there's an explicit formula for that. I'm not going to describe how to do it, but yeah, that's how you do that. So basically, the total number of edges we can make is the sum of the count of di times the count of di minus 1 over 2. Conveniently, this sums to 1. So we have one edge we can make on this graph. And we have three extra edges that we have to put down. So automatically, we can know that there's no way to make this graph, because we have too many edges to put down. We just can't make them. And we can't repeat edges either. Like We can't have this edge three times. That would be lame. Although if we could, then... Well, actually, that kind of makes the formula easier. But we can't, unfortunately. So, let's say, however, we didn't have too many edges. Then how many, how many ways are there to place the extra edges? 
So these are the number of total possible edges we can have. Let's call this S. S, this, um, actually let's call it P, P for possible, right? So we have P total edges we can make. And we have, so we have P total edges we can make. And then we have the number of edges, M, minus the number of edges we've already put down for the tree, minus M minus 1, to put down left. So it's we have p edges total we can make, and we have to choose m minus n plus 1 of those. So uh, I'm going to be nice to myself and call this k. Um, then we have p choose k edges. Oh, this is a disgusting drawing, so make that a bit better first. So we have p choose k edges. The issue is p can be up to n squared. And we can't do that because it's just too big. Also, obviously, if p is less than k, then we can't do anything because we have too many edges. So that works here. So if p is less than k, 0. Otherwise, p is greater than or equal to k. So we have to compute p choose k. Now, what is the formula for p choose k? It's p factorial times p minus k factorial times k factorial. So let's break this up into two segments. We have p factorial over p minus k factorial times 1 over k factorial. Note that k is at most m. So k is less than or equal to m, which is less than or equal to 2 times 10 to the 5th. So k is small. p may be large, but k is small, and that's important. So we can compute both of so we can compute 1 over k quickly. We just do some modular stuff, modular inverse, combinatorics. Uh, I'll link my blog to how to do modular stuff if you want to see it. And Yeah, you can read that blog in the description for how to do all this modular combinatoric stuff. But the point is we can do this in O of um, either k log like 10 to the 9th plus 7, which is the mod, or just O of k. It doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Basically, we can compute this quickly. What about this? So, most of these terms cancel out. That's the cool part about the factorial formula. And this formula is basically, it's p times p minus 1 times p minus 2 times dot 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 times p minus k plus 1. That's just how factorials work. Because p factorial is... Um, I'm going to create space for myself. So, what color do I use? P factorial equals P times P minus 1 times dot 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 times P minus K plus 1 times P minus K times dot 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 times 1. And k factorial, I'm going to draw these colors strategically, k factorial equals, or actually, sorry, I did this wrong. Wait, did I? No, I did not. What we're actually interested in is p minus k factorial equals p minus k times dot 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 times 1. So these are the same, essentially. And we're dividing them out. We're dividing this by this, so all of these cancel out. And therefore, we're left with this. So because we only subtract up to k, this has k terms. So even though it's an enormous binomial, 
because k itself is small, we can do this quickly. This is, let's say, O of k times something, and this is also O of k. And k, and since we have this, O of k equals O of m. So everything is simple. Yeah, that's how we do this. We just, like, basically bash out the binomial by messing with the formulas a bit. And then the final answer is just p choose k, which we know how to do, times the number of ways to compute the original tree, which we also know how to do. So that's that. OK, so I know how to solve the first subtask of this problem, but not the second. So I will let you read the problem on your own. It's fun. Basically, the idea of this is we store the way to get the first subtask is we do dynamic programming. Um, dynamic programming is on the position, the last element we took, and the direction. Now, why? How does this work? Because n is big. So let's say the sum of n is less than or equal to 10 to the fourth. However, m can be whatever it is. So m can be less than or equal to 10 to the fifth. So the sum of n times m is less than or equal to 10 to the tenth, or 10 to the ninth, which could possibly pass, but generally it won't. So we need to be smart about this, basically. <clears throat> Since this is also has an extra factor of 2, there's a bunch of extra computing stuff you have to do. It's kind of ugly. And there's a lot of time spent. Actually, wait, how does this work? Pretty sure mine, put a mine spent a decent amount of time. Yeah, it wasn't that good. So, I don't know, maybe you could squeeze it. It's possible, but it's not the easiest thing to do. So um, in terms of this dynamic programming, basically, given the last one, you can update a new one by just saying either you go up one, so up to last plus one, or you go down one to last minus one. Then either you have to make an extra direction switch depending on whether you're going up here or down here initially, then, and also you have to check if the new value of last, the new value you're going to, is, is valid. That is, either the new value is equal to one of these, or it's negative one, in which case it can be anything. So the transition is simple if you know how to do dynamic programming. However, we have to, we have to get it down. We have to get the complexity down. And the way to do this is simple. Um, let's say we have some array. Let's say we have like seven, negative one, negative one, negative one. But like, what does this change to? And like, what are the actual values we can reach? Because this sequence is at most length n. And it turns out the actual values we can reach are only within the range of 4 and 10, specifically a0 minus n, a0 plus n. And even if a0 is negative 1, this can be anything. Because no matter what, we can't go more than n above or below any value in the array, since we only have n switches and each of them is exactly one apart. That's just how an elevator moves. So the value of last, there are really only O of n values for it. So if we... Now, if if the whole array is negative one, that's a special case. Um, otherwise, it actually isn't a special case. I don't think. If you do the DP right, it isn't. It doesn't matter. But the point is, you can scale down the array so that you fix some value to be n, right? So here, n is four. Now you have to subtract three from everything else that isn't negative one to make that work. So you'll. 
since you subtract this to make it 4, now you subtract this to make it 2, and you do that for everything. You also do it for the bounds. Initially, everything can be in the range 1 to m. However, now it can be in the range 2, negative 2 to m minus 3. Since we decrease everything else by 3, we have to also decrease the range we can move the elevator in. So once we do this, um, the dynamic programming is relatively simple. We find any element, scale the whole array so that that element is n. Then every value will be within the range of 0 and 2n. It's actually technically 1, 2, 2n minus 1, or rather these bounds, but exclusive, because you can only switch. No, wait, never mind. Is that right? Yeah, it is. But anyway, it doesn't matter. You can just assume it's within the range 0 to 2n. Because that's convenient for implementation. And then the dynamic programming is instead of O of n times m, it's just O of n squared. Since n is 1,000 each time in the first subtask, that's enough. Now my idea for the second subtask is basically just each group of negative ones is independent. Either it's possible or it's not. So you just do a ton of casework. And then you basically store for each point what's the best, like let's say um, 5, 4, negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, 3. Like what's the best point you can get to here while having gone up the last point? And what's the best point you can get to here without while having gone down the last, the last time? And so then you use those values to compute new values, and you do casework on every group of negative ones, and it's disgusting. And I was not able to make this case work work. I just didn't know how to like do it. Um, I don't know. Maybe there is a better way. Hopefully, but that's the best I can do right now. So that's my idea for elevator. And then this one, um, I have no idea how to do the uh, the full version, but I do know how to do the first subtask, and that's the subtask where all of the numbers are the same parity. Again, I will let you read this problem on your own since it's fun. So let's say we have an array of, I don't know, just a bunch of odd numbers. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Right? Okay. So the thing to notice is that, well, first of all, if we can't make the whole thing into one element, then we want to use the first element as little as possible. Because every time we use the first element, we increase the sum of the first element. So we want the array to be beautiful, so we would rather not use the first element that much. Another thing to notice is that you can immediate, immediately collapse any group of four into the same parity. Because these will become two evens then these evens together will become an odd. And so even if these were yeah, even if these were even, then you can collapse these into two odds and then these into and then the two odds into an even. So any group of four will make the same parity. So therefore, um, four, yeah. You can collapse So basically the process is just greedily take the last four elements collapse them into a bigger element, and then put it at the back of the array again. And then while you still have four elements in the array, keep doing that. Then finally, you might have two elements of the same, you might have two or three elements of the same parity left. So if you can do one more collapse, do it. Otherwise, that's the final array. Um, so for example, these will collapse to eight, these will collapse to 16, then this will collapse to 25. So we'll have 1 and 25 as our final array. Now, why is this optimal? Actually, no, 1 and 25 is not the final array. Then we can collapse these two into 26. So what this means is, at the end, either you'll have 1, 2, or 3 elements. And still, everything is the same parity. So only when you have 3 elements left, are you going to have two elements in the final array? Because if you have one, you already have one element left. Otherwise, you can collapse these two to make one element. 
Otherwise, you collapse the last two for this, and then you'll have two elements left. Why is this optimal? First of all, if everything can be collapsed into one element, then like it doesn't matter the order in which you do the operations as long as you do it validly. Validly. Because like there's no order of operation. Well, so each even operation increases the total sum of the array by one. However, there's no order of operations that minimizes the number of evens. Because once you pair two odds together, you get an even that you now need to cancel out with another even. And if you didn't pair these two odds together, then like obviously you wouldn't finish. So you have to pair the odds together, and then the evens together, and then the odds and evens and whatnot until you finish. So if there's one element, it's automatically optimal. If there are two elements, it's also optimal because you make the first element as small as possible. Like there's no better way to make the first element smaller. So the sequence will always be the most beautiful, and it will always be as short as possible. So if there are two elements, how do we know there isn't a sequence where there is one element? And basically the way we do these operations is, because everything has the same parity, there's no way like doing a greedy, um, like taking the last four elements can mess us up in the future. You can kind of think about that for yourself, why it'll be optimal. Um, Yeah, it basically comes down to that. Uh, I don't know, also proof by AC. But, um... Hmm, I wonder if... I think the only times we have one element... No, never mind, I'm not going to say anything right now. But, um... There's something that has to do with like power of twos. Maybe like the only time you have on one element is where you have some like two to the m minus one. And in that case, there's no way you can have more than that. Yeah, like there's no better process. So also this is O of n because you remove at least one element from the array each time. And I guess it's O of n times four, which is still O of n, so it's fine. The complexity, or the, um, what is it? How does this work? Yeah, the time isn't that bad. So that's how you do the first subtask. You just basically take any group of four elements from the back, merge them, then stick them back in the back, and that will always be enough. So, uh, that's it, really. I don't have the idea for the second subtask. Um, also don't have the idea for chefing and swaps at all. So we'll leave that be. Um, that's basically it. Still red. Still happy with that. Barely red, but less barely red than the first time. So that's good. Um, yeah. Still gives us a ton of high ranking on that because it's good. Okay, uh, that was it. That was the lunchtime. This video came out incredibly long because there's a lot of explaining solutions and stuff. But yeah, that's it. See you guys.